carry me away and lift me from this place ease my burdens Lord take me to your world let me see your face carry me away when I close my eyes I can see your face An ocean of love washes over me Over me And I am in your presence Carry me away Lift me from this place to your world let me see your face carry me away when I hear your voice power of your word emotions of peace flood right through my heart I live for you and I embrace your holiness carry me away lift me from this place my burdens low. Take me to your world Let me see your face Carry me away Carry me away Lift me from this place Ease my burdens low. Hello and welcome to another SDA Q&A. I'm your host for today, Peter Dixon, 
and my very special guest is Mark Bro. How are you, Mark? Doing all right. How are you? I am terrific. Now, we chatted last week uh, on a different platform. We were just going to have a brief kind of uh, session, a bit of an experiment, commenting on some of the posts in a different Facebook group called Voice. And uh, it went so well and took a turn and to, into a different place, and it ended up being a, a huge Q&A. And so I thought, let's get you back on SDA Q&A, where uh, it's probably a more appropriate platform to be able to have this kind of a discussion and invite people to ask questions. And uh, so welcome. Good to have you here. Thanks. Now, uh, the the main interest that people have got around you is your involvement um, with David Koresh. You were, would you say, quite high up in the, um, the uh, movement? Um, I've yeah, called, I, would have, I would have been um, second in charge. Yeah, I've called you a former yeah. lieutenant. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Mark Bro, young Mark, um, and then I want you to lead up into how you met David Koresh. So tell us about your early childhood and then perhaps some into, into a little bit about work, career, st um, studies, and then what led you to bump into David Koresh? Okay, um, I'll, I'll warn you, the, the story is a little bizarre, uh, not probably what you would expect, so, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you how it went. So I grew up uh, in America. My dad was in the United States Air Force, so we bounced around here and there. I was born in Arkansas, but I don't remember any of it. Grew up mostly in Hawaii, um, although we lived in other places. Uh, I grew up uh, Roman Catholic. We used to go to the uh, church on the base, um, and it was, you know, used by Protestants and things like that as well. And uh, didn't really think too much about religion as such. I guess I was a normal kid other than being legally blind, but I see well enough to run around and play football and tackle people and, and that sort of thing. Um, maybe not so good at getting the ball, but I could see people pretty well, so I could tackle them. And uh, so I was sort of interested in in religion i don't know it always kind of attracted me but you know being a kid you're just sort of like yeah okay um and then one day uh i was curious to know what was in the bible that i had no idea now growing up catholic um you, you get the um the missal and you know the so you'd have you know whatever the church fed you so you usually it'd be a reading from the gospels and often a reading from the writing the epistles usually from paul but sometimes from other ones and then you know you would just go to mass and i'd see this thing you know the bible and i didn't know what was in it so uh the the uh, american library for the blind which is a government institution it's fantastic for blind people they had uh the bible on what they call talking book there were records special records though they didn't they, you couldn't play them on normal record players mm. And the, the reader of the Bible was a guy named Alexander Scorby, who was a Shakespearean actor. He was excellent. I, I highly recommend if anybody wants an audio Bible, if you could still get a hold of an Alexander Scorby reading of the Bible, it's well worth it. He was unbelievable. Uh, unfortunately, passed away now. Anyway, so I was reading and I was just fascinated. I was 10 years old. And, you know, being 10, I love the war stories, you know, David and Jonathan and Saul and and all that sort of thing. You know, the, the law, Exodus, and the, the stories of the Exodus were really interesting, but the, you know, the law part was a bit boring, but I got through it, and uh, I didn't really know anything about the Bible. In fact, um, I actually thought Ben Hurd parted the Red Sea, and that's not a joke. I, you know, just so I hadn't seen the movie Ben Hur, and I thought it was him, and then I found out it was Moses. <laughs> um, the thing that really freaked me out uh, the second most was finding out about Paul because he starts off as Saul and he's killing Christians. And then he becomes Paul, the guy I had been, you know, introduced to during the, you know, the church, the Catholic church. We would read his stuff every, you know, every Sunday. And I'm thinking, that's Paul? Um, that really uh, surprised me. But the thing that freaked me out the most was the book of Revelation. I had no idea. 
So I'm reading the book of Revelation and I remember uh, running into uh, the kitchen. My mom was cooking dinner. I said, Mom, you're not going to believe what's in the Bible. Man, there's a seven-headed, ten-horned dragon like Godzilla. And there's these locust creatures from hell, I guess. And they come and there's a big war in heaven. And, uh, and my mom said, that can't be in the Bible. Like, it is. I just read it, you know. So anyway, I was, uh, I was really intrigued. I didn't, you know, know what it meant. Um, anyway, kind of long story short, um, asked the priest. The priest said pretty much, well, this is too difficult for you to understand. You're too young. Okay, fine. So, you know, being a kid, I, I sort of um, uh, uh, gave it up. And then one day I was I was playing in my backyard, and I got to wondering about the Book of Revelation. And one thing that really struck me was, you know, for a time the beast, whoever that was, uh, the beast wins. It says, you know, they you'll make war against the saints and overcome them. I thought, why would God do that? And I started pondering it, and you know, what this and that. And the next thing I knew, so I was in Hawaii. It was about four o'clock. The afternoon, so the sun was shining. The next thing, it went all dark, and I looked in front of me and I saw this being, like eight foot tall, with a like dressed in armor, wearing a sword, face as bright as uh, the sun, and I just collapsed. And then he lifted me up. I'm, I'm shortening this here, and he lifted me up and he said, "Don't be afraid," and he directed me to look up in uh, in the heavens, and I saw a bunch of stuff, you know. Maybe someday I can detail what I saw. Uh, and I knew uh, that I was supposed to understand the book of Revelation. So when, when I came out of it, I mean, I was wide awake. The first thing I thought was there is no way I'm telling anybody that just happened to me. Um, and the second thing I thought was um, maybe I'm supposed to find out what the book of Revelation is all about, but I want to do it without telling anybody. So that's what started my quest for understanding the book of Revelation. And then there was an organization called the Christian Record Braille Foundation, which those of you in America would know. It's a Seventh-day Adventist organization devoted to providing Adventist materials to the blind. It started in 1899, and the CRBF was really ahead of its time. And they put on a, in Hawaii, they put on a blind camp every year for, for blind kids. And so I used to I would go every summer, and that's how I got introduced to SDA doctrine, because they had a pastor there who was also blind, uh, uh, totally blind, a dear man. Um, and he was talking about the books of Daniel and Revelation. I thought, oh, wow, somebody's talking about it, because every time I brought it up with a priest at the Catholic Church, they were like, it's too difficult. Nobody really understands it. Just, just you know, stop, stop worrying about it. So here, here he was talking about it. So anyway, I got interested. Sorry if I'm dragging this out. That's oh, very um, interesting. Go for it. So I, so I got interested in that, and um, uh, and then I started reading uh, Ellen White, um, and. For some reason, I didn't think about getting the talking book. So the Christian Record Braille Foundation has Ellen White on audio, but for some reason, I didn't think about it. So I actually read uh, the Conflict of the Ages series uh, on my own with my eyes, which I can tell you was not easy. Uh, but, but as I was reading, I, I got better and better, and I, and I finished all five of those books reading with my eyes. It's just surprised everybody. Um, that I could do that because I hadn't really done that before. Mm. So, um, and I was intrigued, you know, that Ellen White was a prophet because of what had happened to me. Uh, I had the occasional dream, but other than that big vision, uh, it's the only thing I can call it, um, nothing had happened. So, but I got converted. I thought this is the truth, you know, uh, this is the way. And so I left the Catholic Church. My family was not happy. Uh, there was some tension there for a while, but eventually they they were accepted it. And then I, I decided to study at Pacific Union College to be a pastor. And so I studied there for four years. Um, oh, didn't that, huh? all, oh, sorry. That would have been from 1981 to 1985. Right. So I just missed Ford. So Ford did his 
should I say infamous or famous, uh, Pacific Union College sermon in 1980. Uh, so I missed that, but it was it was bad. Uh, I got there in 81, and that was all anybody was talking about. The teachers were scared uh, if they ever said the wrong thing and so forth and so Boy, on. So that was, can, can you share a little bit more about that as an aside? Because he did the famous talk October 27, 1979, and then Glacier View came about in early uh, or in 1980. Um, so... You then arrive in 81. Tell us a little bit about the buzz. How did you know there was a bit of a fear to talk? Oh, well, um, you know, well, first of all, you know, that his, it was um, he when his, his talk was recorded. And so there were cassette tapes, you know, younger watchers look that up if you don't know what a cassette is. <laughs> and, um, so we'd all everybody heard it. I mean, they, they played it at our church in Hawaii. It was a special yeah. thing. People. Wow. So I knew what he had said. And yeah. okay, so in 81, the main problem, okay, I, I will tell you the truth. Most of the faculty, all but two of the theology faculty agreed with Ford. Mm. Okay, so basically Ford said 1844, it's, you can't you can't get to cleansing you know the, our doctrine of 1844. You can't get to it from Daniel eight. It's the little horn that pollutes the sanctuary and not the sins of the saints. Mm. Okay, I mean essentially that's what he was saying. But the main problem that Ford had at PUC was that he contradicted Ellen White. Okay, because Ford in his book D, you know Daniel DNL said that Jesus made a mistake. He thought that he thought he was going to come back really soon and he didn't and, and Ford was all about Antiochus Epiphany being the fulfillment of Daniel 8. And you'd think well if, if they were going to go after Ford for that, it would be that, I should say. But all they cared about was that he contradicted Ellen White and it caused uh, a big problem and so any um uh theology faculty or any teacher for that matter who was caught uh, supporting Ford uh, was getting uh, would be in trouble, and what was happening was all the really conservative Adventists were withdrawing their their funds from PUC. I remember they were trying to build a new science building, um, and they couldn't finish it because all the donations had dried up because PUC was obviously a den of apostasy. <laughs> uh, and it was a big that problem, and I. Who were some okay. of the lecturers? Who were some of the professors and academics that were there at the time? Um, Fred Veltman, uh, who was the one you may know, who examined uh, Ellen White for plagiarism. Yeah. He, he was yes. the one. Yeah, an uh, eight-year study. That's right. Yeah, I, uh, I, he was the Greek teacher there, but I, I didn't learn Greek from him. I took some other courses. Uh, Dr. Larry Richards, who was a, a world-renowned Greek scholar, and he's the one that taught me Greek, so I was very fortunate there. Uh, Larry Mitchell was the Hebrew teacher, and you know, he taught other classes. Dennis Preby, uh, Erwin Gain, an Australian. Yeah. Um, Erwin uh, and Dennis were the conservative ones, weren't they? Yeah, you know your you know your history. Yeah, they were <laughs> they were adamant against uh, against. Uh, Ford, yeah. I interviewed her with son in season two, and uh, I've also oh, interviewed, okay. interviewed Des three times in season one. Uh, Larry Mitchell interviewed him as well. So it's interesting, though, getting it from a student's perspective. Right. I would have been interested in, uh, you know, uh, I didn't know. I mean, I would have been interested in Larry Mitchell. Um, he, he's the one who taught me uh, Hebrew. It's a and, fascinating uh, interview. You should go back and have a look at it. It's a really interesting one. Yeah, um, yeah. He was he was really under the pump. It, it was it was pretty bad. Um, you know the 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 atmosphere and um, yeah. So um, and then um, and then Walter Ray hit. I can't remember the exact year, <laughs> but really on the heels of four, Walter Ray just smashed everything. And you joined um, the church at this crazy time where there was plagiarism. There was Davenport. Was, oh yeah, Davenport. Who can forget that? <laughs> it was yeah. the Des Ford issue. Yeah. Yeah. Very go on. This is fascinating. I love anyway. hearing a person that was there on the ground as a student. That perspective has not not been one I've really heard before. So what yeah. were you 
and Sorry. what were your thoughts coming into the church and then stumbling across all of this? Uh, well, I had I I had thought that um, the Adventist Church had the answers, and now I was starting to realize that we didn't have the answers. Because I'll be honest with you, I both agreed and disagreed with Desmond Ford. I never met him. I always meant to, but I never got the chance. Um, I could absolutely see what he was saying about Daniel 8. It was the little horn that was um, causing the um, pollution of the sanctuary. But um, I got around that by, um, you know, because I really wanted Ellen White to be right. I, I got to say, I loved Ellen White's book, and I didn't know about the plagiarism until Walter Ray. Loved her books. And uh, I, I did notice some problems, uh, but I thought, okay, maybe I'm just a student. You know, maybe someone can point out, but I, I did notice some issues with Ellen White's writings, but I sort of was willing to put that aside. Uh, but I agreed with Ford when he talked about Hebrews 9 and saying that Jesus went to the most holy place upon his uh, ascension. You know, that was that was clear. So, but I got around the Daniel 8 problem by reading Leviticus 16, and I noticed that the high priest uh, went into the sanctuary first to offer uh, uh, the um, bullock for himself and his house. And then he stepped out and got the, the goat and then went into the most holy place and offered it again. So I thought, okay, well, even though I can't get there from Daniel 8, if Leviticus 16 is a type of the second coming or the, the final day of atonement, then Jesus could have gone into the most holy place you know, upon his ascension, just as the Bible says, and then gone out into the first apartment. And then uh, on October 22nd, 1844, uh, gone back into the most holy place, you know, as the, um, the goat offering and started the investigative judgment. So that's how I rationalized it. And in fact, um, I remember talking to a number of students explaining my theory, and that actually soothed a lot of nerves the, the students we were really like oh man could this whole thing be wrong could ellen white have been wrong uh you know this was really um really hard for us but my explanations calmed a lot of people down including myself so i thought okay well even though daniel 8 um doesn't get to where i want to go um i can still get there from leviticus 16 of course I didn't want to deal with the problem that Ellen White had expounded Daniel 8 mm. in a certain way. But I was so relieved that I could figure out a way to get around this. I just said, okay, we're, we're all good. And so then I, um, I kept up my studies. A number of the teachers were uh, asked to leave for various uh, reasons, um, as you know. Mm. And um, then um, I didn't, I didn't get a, we called a call. I didn't get a call uh, as a pastor. Uh, it, they felt that being legally blind as I am, it would be, it would have been difficult for me to be a pastor. And well, I said, that would have been an interesting moment. Sorry to interrupt there, but I just want to highlight what an interesting moment that was. Um, if they had given you a job, you may never have met David Koresh. And that's right. And the the work you did with David Koresh demonstrated that you were very capable at building a, a flock, shall we say, and if they'd given you a church, you would have uh, had a very successful career as an Adventist minister. But I think so. But yeah. instead moment sent uh, you down a different path. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's interesting how things work because I said, so their logic, there was some logic to it because, you know, pastors have to drive around a lot, but I basically said, just give me a church in the city. I'll use public transport and the telephone. I, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I was a legally blind person who went to a normal high school, the first one to do it. I went to a normal college without any help. I said, look, I figure these things out. I'll be fine. Yeah, but they didn't give me a, a call. So I was disillusioned. Um, in fact, the ACLU wanted to get involved, but I read 1 Corinthians 6 and said, no, I'm not going to sue the church. So I just uh, decided, well, that 
didn't work out. I didn't understand why. I thought God had called me to be a pastor, um, and now I wasn't going to be a pastor. And and some of the things I had believed, and by then I had been aware of Ellen White's plagiarism, things like that. I, I didn't want. I really liked Ellen White, uh, and I didn't want to reject her, but I couldn't escape the fact that she plagiarized. Um, that you know, like anybody who seriously looks at the evidence. You can't conclude anything but, even though uh, Dr. Veldman tried his best to conclude otherwise um, for the church. You know, even he was honest. I think he said it was like 2% or something. But, you know, 2% is two, well, he, it's not just 2%. It's, it's he, where he was, she did it. He was saying 2% actual copying. But then, I, and I know the church jumped on that. And when they wrote a little tiny article in Ministry magazine, they highlighted one paragraph that kind of summarised the whole eight-year study and were basically saying what a relief to find it's only 2% of copied material. But we know that borrowing and plagiarism includes paraphrasing content of ideas in sequence. And uh, he goes on to say in his two two 2,500, what is it, 2,000? Oh, I can't remember. It's a long report um, yeah. that, that she definitely uh, paraphrased a good 70 to 90% from memory. I don't have the details in front of me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think I even said to Dr. Veltman once, he's a very thorough scholar, mm. said, uh, you know, based on what I've seen, you would fail me if I did this. Yeah. <laughs> and he acknowledged it. Yeah. Absolutely. You would fail how did, did you how did you reconcile that? Well, that that's that's I suppose that comes down to the story of why I ended up with David Koresh because um, so I had that one experience when I was ten. I had a couple of others. Uh, I had a couple of doozies in in college, but for the most part, I managed to convince myself that it would all go away. And then when I didn't get a call as a pastor, I concluded it was because I wasn't you know, worthy. Um, and, uh, and, and anyway, I was just going to go back to uh, a life. I had worked my way through college programming computers. So I did, although I didn't want to be a computer programmer, I thought, well, I'll, what else am I going to do? Uh, so I, th I went back to Hawaii to, to do that. And I just thought, well, I don't know what happened. I don't know why. Um, I thought, God wanted me to do stuff. I don't even know what God wants from me anymore. Does God even care? Um, that's where I was. And then uh, the visions came back in a big way. And one of them was, again, you know, I've written all this down. So one of them was I had, I had this it started off as a dream, but when I came out of it, I was standing up. So make of that what you will. Um, the, the short of it was, that an angel or being, I guess I'll call him an angel, said I was nearly spiritual, spiritually dead. And that my physical eyesight was a mirror of my spiritual eyesight. Sorry, let me just stop this. So, should have put this on silent. So, that was a slap in the face to me because I had a degree in theology and some this angel, the only way I can describe it, was telling me that my physical eyesight, which isn't very good, was an example of my, it was a mirror of my spiritual eyesight. And I was shown seven people in a van and the angel said, go to Loma Linda uh, and these people will help you see. Uh, so I came out of it thinking, oh, no, they're, they're back. But it doesn't matter because I, I don't have any money. I can't go to Loma Linda. That was to go to Loma Linda to do my master's. They actually had a master's program in theology at uh, Loma Linda University, uh, a small one. But you know, so this is around, 80, around 85 now. Yeah, it was 1985. Right? So I thought, well, I can't afford to go there. I can't afford the tuition. I can't afford the plane fare, so it doesn't matter. And then the um, Center for the Blind called me up. So this was this happened in 1985. I think it was December the 23rd. So on December the 27th, and they reopened after Christmas, somewhere like that. 
they called me up and they said, we heard what happened. Um, we had a lot of hope for you, you know, being a blind kid going to normal school. We've decided to, and uh, I had mentioned, you know, maybe going for my master's before. And so they said, look, we've, we've met and we decided we're going to pay your way, your tuition for Loma Linda, and we will pay for your books. And if you need computer, uh, a new computer, we'll pay for that too. Wow. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Right? And then my parents said, well, if that's going to happen, we'll pay for your plane fare. So I didn't have any excuse. So I went on a plane, I quit my job. Uh, I thought, I, I don't know what's going on, but I better get over to Loma Linda. And so I got to Loma Linda. The second day I was there, I was in the supermarket and I was wearing a black Dallas Cowboys t-shirt. I'm a big Dallas Cowboys fan. Sorry, those of you who are in America, I know a lot of you probably hate the Cowboys, but that's too bad. Anyway, um, so I'm wearing a black, uh, T-shirt, Dallas Cowboys T-shirt. I'm in the supermarket, Loma Linda University. And Perry Jones, uh, Koresh's father-in-law, saw me wearing the Dallas Cowboys T-shirt, and he was from Texas. And he was with his daughter, uh, Rachel, who is Koresh's wife. So he, Perry would talk to anybody, so he came to talk to me, and those were two people I saw in my dream. And I'm thinking, now oh, this can't be happening. What's going on here? I recognize them right away. And... Uh, uh, Perry uh, told me he was a journalist. That was actually true. He had press credentials. And we get to talking, and he is telling me about how he would talk to people in the moral majority, you know, Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell. Uh, he knew them. Uh, and I, you know, I know he knew them because we, we worked together for a while afterwards. And we both felt that the Seventh-day Adventist Church wasn't doing enough to stem the rise of the moral majority. Because, you know, we read Ellen White, Sunday Laws, and these people on the religious right, they want to legislate morality, and that's just one step away from the Sunday Law. So, so he, he was fascinating because he knew all these people, and he was telling me. And uh, so, you know, I was like, okay, so we struck up a friendship. And then the second time we met, he said, look, um, he took a chance and he said, I think my son-in-law is a prophet. And I said, well, okay. I mean, we have Ellen White, so all right, you, maybe he is a prophet. And, and I, I really sort of liked Perry at the time. He was a genuine guy. Uh, he really did have press credentials. So he said, you know, I'd like you to meet him. Okay, great. So we made it time for him to come to my uh, place where I was staying in Loma Linda. Um, so he dro uh, Koresh drove up in the van that I had seen in my dream. And uh, Koresh was really good with cars. He was really, really good with cars. He could fix anything. Um, except that when that van broke down in... Uh, San Bernardino, which is the town next to Loma Linda. He couldn't fix it until just, I think it was like the day he drove up to meet me. And he fixed it. He drove up. I recognized the van. And so then we went into like a, the lobby area of where I was staying. Um, you know, there were like a bunch of apartments for the graduate students. And it was like a lobby. And like you'd, you would, commenced, you know, you'd commenced your studies by now. That's right. Yeah. And so we got to talking and, you know, he said, I'm going to show you more in three hours than you've learned in your whole theology degree. And I thought, well, that would normally be considered an arrogant statement. But, you know, prophets in the Bible, they were never uh, backward about coming forward, so to speak. So I said, all right, uh, show me what you got, basically. And so we, we talked for three hours and he showed me enough uh, about the book of Revelation that I thought, well, I think there might be something here. So that's how I met uh, Koresh. And then, you know, eventually uh, we had more talks. I met more people. And eventually I saw all the seven people uh, in my dream, including my wife, Elizabeth, who was the seven. And so by then I was in the twilight zone. And then when I told Perry and Vernon my story, they were in the twilight zone. Um, and uh, anyway, that's, that's, uh, how it all got what started. What do you mean by twilight zone? 
Uh, well, they had thought, uh, I, I'm sorry, I said Vernon. That's how I knew him, David Koresh. Um, yes. They had thought Koresh was the only prophet. Now suddenly somebody else had come along with a vision, um, you know, and what are we going to do? Are there two prophets? And Koresh told me you know, later, he said he was worried about his own position. Was, I'm go where I, was, I'm gonna, was I going to take over from him? Uh, and so they, you know, I found this out afterwards. They told me, you know, Perry and, and Koresh would, would talk amongst themselves saying, what are we going to do? This is just bizarre. Um, this guy shows up. He's, he's seen seven people. He's just showed up at Loma Linda. And, and now here we are. And um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, it was, it was, we didn't, you know, what are we going to do? Um, I didn't want to think of myself uh, as a prophet, but I couldn't deny what had happened. Um, but in, in short order, that's why I was, I eventually became uh, second in charge. So what, what Koresh did was he put me under the tutelage of his father-in-law, Perry. And Perry taught me all the, the Branch Davidian doctrine before Koresh. So like I, like I told you in, the, um, in our voice interview, for those of you SDAs here, just quick context. The Branch Davidians uh, were an offshoot of an offshoot. So in 1929-30, Victor Howdeff, uh, broke away from the church, and he founded a movement called the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, you might know them as the Shepherd's Rod. And his, his thing, it was complicated, but basically he taught that Israel uh, was literal in prophecy and that it would be led by a modern-day David, which he thought was himself. Um, and then uh, he died... Uh, and then his wife took over, and then the shepherd's rod uh, broke apart in 1959. Uh, and then one of the offshoots of that was the Branch Davidian Seventh Day Adventists. So they were the it was official name. It was led by a guy in Texas named Ben Roden, who believed that he was a prophet, and um, so he started the Branch Davidian Seventh Day Adventist Church. He died in 1978. And then his wife, Lois Roden, said she had had a vision of a silver angel. Uh, and somehow from that, she got that the Holy Spirit was the feminine aspect of God. And, and that was a big deal. And she was accepted in uh, a lot of circles. So it was kind of a popular uh, doctrine. And she uh, created a magazine called She Kina, so S-H-E in bold and then Kina um, to emphasize that. Um, they even, uh, Perry and, and, and Lois Roden even uh, were welcomed as guests by Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines. Um, and they, they uh, met him and his wife. And, you know, I mean, you know, they, Perry could get himself in, in all kinds of places. Mm -hmm. and, and then Perry started doing the religious liberty thing. And he knew Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, uh, Jim Baker. You know, you knew it. Uh, he would. He was there, and he was telling him about Sunday laws and the Sabbath. So his stories were fascinating. I mean, you, you know how these people reacted to the Sabbath. Um, so you know that really um, intrigued me. And then uh, there was a rift, and David Koresh, known as Vernon Howell, uh, claimed that he was a, a prophet, and then eventually he broke away and started a movement called the Davidian Branch, Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. But eventually he took over Mount Carmel and, and assumed the name of Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventist, which uh, Ben Roden had started. So that's the connection with mm -hmm. uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then when, when everything happened, the siege and everything, the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, GC, begged the media, can you please drop Seventh-day Adventists from this? I mean, we, these are... These are not our people, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the media complied. So that's why you know them as Branch Davidian. But their official name was the Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventist uh, Church. And for some reason, SDA Church never sued them because of it. Um, I guess they were too insignificant to, to worry about. So that's the, that's the connection with the SDA Church. 
uh, yeah. can I just take you back to that time you first met him? Did you share with him some of your dreams and visions that first meeting? Uh, no, not the first meeting. Right. Um, and you, were, you were saying that he later maybe saw that as a bit of a threat, that he saw that maybe you were uh, going to be taking over his position. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and I think ultimately that's that's the side he landed down on. But for a while we were friends because, um, you know, I, again, uh, I he was older than me. He was four years older than I was. And he accepted his role as a prophet uh, with his visions. And I thought, well, um, I don't really want mine. Um, you know, but maybe he can, maybe I found the, the one I was looking for, so maybe they'll stop. Or maybe, um, you know, he can coach me. I had no, you know, this is obviously my side of the story. I had no wish to, to assume uh, the leadership of any group. Um, and and so he was kind of like my big brother and i was kind of like his little brother and we and you know once uh, because the visions didn't stop and in january of 1986 i had a a vision so startling that i i wrote to neil c wilson who was president of the gc at the time explained my vision you know you spelling mistakes there and everything but anyway um they knew all about ellen white's editor so they didn't Hold that against me. <laughs> you needed your <laughs> own Marion Davis. I'm sorry? You needed your own Marion Davis and Fanny Bolton. I did, yeah. I thought of it. Believe me, I thought of it at the time. And I got to tell you, you know, when I was writing down that vision, I thought, I wonder, because I still wasn't quite convinced. I, I did seriously consider the possibility I should check myself into a facility. Um. I did wonder, okay, how's this inspiration thing going to work? Is, is something going to just magically come over me and I'm just going to write this vision and it's going to be perfect? There's going to be no mistakes. How's this going to work? I, I was thinking about that the whole day because I was I was in school that day, the, the day I decided to write the letter. And I thought all this time we've been trying to figure out how biblical inspiration works. I might find out tonight. It was, you know, it was uh, quite interesting. But I wrote to Neil C. Wilson, and that's when he sent, uh, those of you who are in The Voice, that's when he sent Robert Olson mm. to talk to me. And Robert Olson said that he was quite shaken by my vision. Uh, long story short, I saw Jesus in the sanctuary. Uh, he uh, stepped out of the most holy place and um, was about to come back to earth. And he said, you, you need to tell my people. And I did think at the time, this is interesting because I don't really believe in 1844 anymore as, as originally taught. Um, he's he's speaking to the. I didn't I didn't have a, a an alternative at that time, but I maybe he's just speaking to SDAs so that they can understand. Um, but anyway, apparently Neil Wilson, according to Robert Olson, was quite shaken, mm -hmm. and so he sent. Robert Olson to me, and Olson did not know that I was meeting Koresh and that that group had been the offshoot of the Shepherd's Rod. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was quite favorable to me at first, but then later on, after he left, he found out, and then he was he wasn't so favorable. But so that's Neil when Olson um, obviously took it seriously enough to send Robert Olson down to actually meet you in person. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I think Neil Wilson might have been pretty shaken by the vision and I've written all these things down. So, I mean, you know, I always keep a record of these things. And that's when I, that's when he told me, for those of you who are on the voice interview that um, the, one of the functions of the Ellen White st estate that many people don't realize is they monitor people who have visions and dreams and think there might be something there. And at that time they were aware of 26 people mm. in the Adventist church who had visions and dreams. And uh, and he told me, uh, I think it was him who told me that there was, I think he did, yeah, that there was a sort of unofficial publication called Heavenly Messages where these people, you know, back then there was no internet, right? You had to publish a magazine. So yeah, yeah. these people would publish their messages. And then I started looking for them just to find out what what they were seeing and what they were saying. 
but that's that's when Robert Olson told me that that was one of the functions of the uh, Ellen White right. estate. And that was 1986. That was 1986. That's right. Isn't that interesting? So you're at Loma Linda, and you'd started the course that year, or was it 85? You started the course. I started in um, 86. And so right, right after the Christmas break, you know. That, yeah. Yeah. And was it a two-year MA, or how long was the it course? Was, yeah. It and was two you... years, a combination of coursework and thesis. So during that two-year period, you, you completed your study. Yeah. And just briefly, as an aside, had you noticed the Des Ford kind of um, thing settle down a bit by then? Um, what was the climate on Loma Linda as compared to the um, the other academy? Well, my view of it was Glacier View was a whitewash. It was a foregone conclusion. He was never going to stay in the church. And it was because um, of his position or what he was doing to Ellen White. He was, and he, was, when, he was questioning her authority in some ways, even though he was a super fan of Ellen White. Yeah, and in fact, in his infamous talk, he tried his best to still uphold Ellen White, mm -hmm. um, for those of you who might remember. But, it, uh, it, you know, people could see what was happening, you know. So I thought Glacier View was a whitewash. And then I, I basically what, my, what I thought at the time was, you know, shh, let's not talk about it anymore. Okay. We don't need to worry about this anymore. It's all it was less of a over. buzz, less of a buzz going on than you'd noticed yeah. earlier. Yeah. And I, I believe that um, this started a lessening of interest in the church in Daniel and Revelation. Um, you know, I don't know how if people think that Adventists are still interested. I mean, now there's a war on and we're kind of at the edge of World War III, so maybe there is. But, but it was, you know, when I was at PUC, we were talking about this all the time, you know, the, the students. Not only the theology students, everybody was saying, what do you think yeah. of Daniel 8, you know? And the, and then there was the is Romans seven pre conversion or post conversion, and does it mean we have does do we really have to be perfect at some stage before you know the close of probation? And these were everybody was talking about it. after Glacier View. You know, like, mm -hmm. Let's just mm -hmm. not talk about this stuff anymore, and and that caused a backlash, um, and a lot of these prophets, the ones that the Ellen White State were were. Uh, sorry, Ellen White Estate we're looking at, a lot of them, it was a backlash against this. And their messages basically were, we have apostatized, uh, the leadership is, has, has compromised mm. Adventist doctrine, they're afraid of the evangelical Sunday-keeping reaction, uh, the Adventist church, which Ford kind of held to, and the church leadership have caved in. We've got to get back to our traditional SDA roots. The sanctuary is the single unique doctrine of the SDA church. It's the only one we have that nobody else does. And so if you take that down, you take away Adventism and the Sabbath is going to be next. That was really every last prophet that I could find um, uh, had that. And there was going to be a big earthquake in California. That was pretty much where they were. Can I yeah. can I just um, insert an interesting little aside there? Um, so I, I was studying at Avondale between eighty one and eighty five, minus a couple of years I went off to surf and play guitar, and so it was oh. a similar kind of dynamic at, that you experienced at PUC at Avondale, um, mm. and then uh, during eighty six and eighty seven, I'd left and was living in New Zealand, and I met. Um, Neil Wilson at some point there I was teaching at one of the Adventist schools and he came and did a a um, morning worship in the conference office there and and I've just literally looked across the side of me and there's a, a famous um, document put out by the concerned brethren you know the basically the Standish brothers and George Burnside and Raglan Marx etc and this one's by oh, okay. Raglan Marx um, and this was dated February, uh, 15th of February 1987, and this is the backlash that, you, that we're, we're talking about. This letter was sent around uh, 
as an open letter to the um, administration and members of the SDA church uh, and specifically addressed to uh, Warunga where the, um, the SPD division office was. But I just thought that's interesting. We're talking about this, this kind of uh, backlash that in some ways created fertile soil for the David Koresh kind of movement to gain more power. And here's just an example of of how upset the fundamentalists were within the church by by 1987, and um, in many ways the leaders were kind of trying to silence it, um, but that pushed a lot of it underground in, as well. Yeah, and in fact, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not maybe I'm not trying to defend the church administration, but there was a lot of money involved. Uh, I think I mentioned before a lot of donations were had gone away, and and. You know that science building that they were trying to build they had to stop it it was it was literally half done mm. uh, because the money ran out and i remember walking by one day you know as i'm legally blind and i said one of my pet wishes is that i could have been a cartoonist i love i would love to be able to draw political cartoons but i can't draw anything i can't even draw a line with a ruler very well <laughs> and so i said to somebody if if i could draw i would just draw a little sign that said no man builds a building unless they first count the cost. And somebody heard me and decided, what a great idea. So the next morning, there was a nice sign with a quote from there. And for some reason, the college thought it was me, and they were pretty upset, and I got hauled up to the wow. to the dean, and I said, little old me, I, I didn't do it. I might have thought it would be an interesting idea, but I didn't do it. Wow. What year were it you was really bad. Like, uh, any, you know, like people who, who, you know, if you were even seen to be out of line, people ratted on you. Yeah. You were yeah. An oh, it was even for the students. Like, yeah. you had to toe the line. In my interview yesterday with um, uh, Steve Daly, a few of the younger people watching were kind of commenting on that era. Um, and he highlighted that really the, the millennials and younger have no idea what it, what it was like back then uh, during that that post glacier view era for almost a decade it was it was a really difficult time to speak your mind yeah and i think the the uh, um final uh, backwash of that is that the church um is just afraid to cause controversy. And uh, if I may, my observation at the moment is that we are having an increasing divide in the church between Western society, you know, Adventists and the more conservative, I'll call them third world, that they may not be quite right, the conservatives. Uh, we see this with the ordination of women debate. Uh, we see this in, in a number of ways and the church to me, it seems like, oh, let's just not do anything and hopefully this will go away. But I think, uh, Ellen, why? I, I went to Italy. Um, oh, this would have been about 10 years ago because uh, Walter Ray was finally translated into Italian. And it just destroyed their church over there. And so I was asked to come down. 10 years ago. Did you yeah. Say? Wow. Yeah. And people were just so upset wow uh, and i remember uh this one guy german guy oh so this was in switzerland I, I knew someone in switzerland so they they asked me to come down to talk about it because because i'd been through it and mm -hmm. the guy who asked me had also been through it he was a fellow student of mine at PUC, and they were just torn apart and you know this one guy uh if anybody had the gift of pastorship, it was him. He wasn't an actual pastor, That's but he, referring he, to. he was good. And he, his whole life, and he starts crying, and he says, I've been deceived. Mm. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm People, just holding up the book we're referring to. Oh, okay, yeah. People don't, uh, maybe the younger ones, don't realize what this did to people. Mm. Um they felt the whole their whole lives they had been lied to. The church had covered things up, and people were leaving the church in droves over this. Yeah, uh, and unfortunately, he was one of them. He he remained a Christian, 
So that was a good thing. What but was his um, name? do you remember? Yeah, his name was Walter, Walter Fair, uh, a Swiss guy. He was in tears uh, because he loved the church so much. He loved Ellen White. And then uh, this stuff got translated into Italian. He was Swiss, so he knew all these languages. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it was bad. Um, and it was it was like having the same nightmare all over again. So you, you're saying this this was only translated in like 2012 or something? Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, and it had this other another second wave of um, a massive impact. That's that's incredible. It did, yeah. And and you know, like in Italy or Switzerland, there's a lot of uh, immigrants from Nicaragua. Uh, who were very conservative, and then it just started tearing them apart. And, and I'm sure some of it got back to Nicaragua. And um, you know, uh, like they, we keep making the same mistake. Instead of confronting this and 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 discussing it with the people and telling them the truth, yeah, so that we can move past it, we just hope it all goes away. Um, and I, I, I just randomly, there's lots of random things are happening in this interview. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's good. I'm saying this end as well. It's it. I I'm enjoying. I like um, serendipitous things. So yeah. as you reach for the white lie there to just hold up and show people the the book that I had read that um, paragraph about the Fred Veltman, the church's response was literally sitting next to it, and I'd had oh, a okay. and I had a bookmark exactly in the spot. So I'll just quickly read that because it just pertains to what we were saying earlier. So this is after the eight-year study, and this relates to this idea that the church just doesn't want to talk about stuff and, and they whitewash it or they water it down. So this is this is their comment. I think it was in, uh, might have been Ministry Magazine um, or Adventist Review or somewhere, but they write this, the eight-year study of Ellen G. White's possible borrowing of materials from other writings for her book, The Desire of Ages, ended this year with researcher Fred Veltman concluding that her book does contain some ideas and phrasing similar to those of other writers, but that it is independent of verbatim borrowing. <laughs> and I just thought... And that's that's not what he concluded. <laughs> that's it. Whereas the reality is, and they're using words like possible and uh, yeah. concluded and similar phrasing, but independent of verbatim borrowing, is that is an... Ab it's a lot. It's a lie. Yeah, it's a lie. There's no other way of describing. And can I just say, for those who who never met Fred Veltman, I had the utmost respect for him as a scholar. He was a very good scholar. We have a lot of good scholars. They were just muzzled. Um, mm -hmm. And he was very nice thorough. Um, and uh, he, I didn't get away with, uh, shall we say, you know, waffling on in his in essays. <laughs> he yeah. was very rigorous. Um, but I, I said it, um, you know, later, I said, you cannot have, I, mean, I, 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 I said this to development, um, you can't have a, an employee of the church auditing plagiarism of one of the founders. <laughs> you just cannot do this. It, it should have been an independent auditor who had no affiliation with the SDA church. Mm -hmm. and no, no disrespect. Fred Veltman, but no. it's this doesn't look good. And in the longer paper that was presented, um, which I think at, in the day was only advertised as being available in the minister's magazine, which was sent out to actual ministers, so not to the general public. And I think yeah. it cost about five hundred dollars to buy it, so that was a lot of money back in the in the eighties. Well, still so, a lot of money now. Uh, yeah, now so you can being, get a liter of gas. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> a liter, yeah. <laughs> so so um, a lot of people weren't privy to the real information, and in the actual document that is his assessment of the, those fifteen chapters of Desire of, of Ages, he's very way more honest. It's in the brief kind of summary that it's a bit watered down. And then they took that summary even further to that one paragraph that I read out. I'm going to be doing an interview with Robert Lindbeck um, coming up soon, all about Veltman, and that's that actual episode in Adventist history. So that's going to be fascinating. That'll be good, yeah.
So, yeah, so you're noticing during this time period continued suppression, not allowing the flaws and faults of Adventism to just be revealed, which shows a, a lack of trust and belief in the, the members of the church. Like, we're not stupid. We can take that stuff on board and deal with it. Um, yeah. But you come to the end of 87, you're finishing that course. You didn't. What what then happened with you and David after that? Yeah, so I mean, eventually, I I became convinced that uh, that he was a prophet. Um, he wasn't, you know, the son of God. Then um, he was a prophet. Um, and you know, just to be clear, we we uh, never believed he was Jesus Christ come again. I mean, we can read Matthew twenty four, same as anybody else. So we had a sort of weird view of it. But anyway, um, I, uh, so in 1986, I had a vision that said I should go to, to Hawaii and and preach. And Koresh didn't want me to go, but he thought, well, if he's had a vision, he's got to go. And the reason I went there was because what Neil Wilson eventually came back with was, um, look, we have a we have a procedure for handling these things. You go to your local congregation, and and then it goes to the the pastor, the the local level, and so forth. And then if if they think there's merit, then it filters up the chain. So my church was the Diamond Head Seventh Day Adventist Church in Honolulu, and so that's why I was thinking, okay, well, should I go or shouldn't? And then I had that vision. Again, you can question whether it was a vision. That's fine. I'm not here to, to glorify me, but I thought, okay, I'm going to go to Hawaii. Now, up until that time, the the Davidians, I'll just call them that, they're really the Davidian branch Davidians at that time. That's too much. Um, they had had real no real success. The shepherd's rod had splintered, and then a lot of these offshoots were just shrinking and and generally, the SDA church had had enough of them. You know, they used to go to the churches in the car parks or parking lots in America and, you know, try to pass out leaflets and all that. And, you know, I was like, yeah, get out of here sort of thing. Uh, so I went to Hawaii um, and I, you know, knew people because I'm from there. And I knew that um, one of the ones that I wanted to try to convert, for lack of a better word, is uh, was Steve Schneider, who anybody who followed the siege would have known that at that time, Steve Schneider was Koresh's right-hand man. And so anyway, I started preaching. And, um, you know, like I said in the voice, I'm, I'm a good speaker. I don't need advertising or anything like that. And so I started something. People were interested uh, and people came, and I was giving Bible studies, talking about the uh, Davidian message. Uh, I sort of saved the Koresh as a prophet until a little later, um, kind of like Adventist preachers used to say, my favorite author instead of Ellen White. And I was sort of guilty of that, but at the branch Davidian level. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I was preaching Book of Revelation, and then people were interested, and then Steve Schneider got converted, and then... Uh, we started preaching to other people, and eventually there were so many people, non-Adventists, that we we uh, we literally went to the conference in Hawaii and said, "Look, there's too many people. I'm exhausted." I was literally giving Bible studies, you know, 17 hours a day. We we had a lot of interest. I said, "We can't cope with this. I know you don't like us, but here's a whole bunch of people. You just take them and preach Adventism, and that's fine with us. We we can't." We're too busy, but you they didn't, didn't want to. Start do it. Your own, you didn't want to start your own Davidian branch of the Davidian branch branch. <laughs> no, no. But I mean, look, we were we were happy for them to join. You know, our movement. I was happy wouldn't to introduce them to Koresh. Wouldn't have, wouldn't have David Koresh back home in the states wanted you to be proselytizing to bring them into his fold. Yeah, well, that's that's. I was happy to do it, but what I'm saying is that we had so many people mm. that that's we true. couldn't. We couldn't deal with them all. Wow! And they were they were Steve and I uh, were really good at this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't realize I was good at this until then. Um, 
And I suppose it's because at that time I was a believer. And so when you have total conviction, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, that's probably what makes fundamentalist Islam so powerful because they have absolute conviction that they speak for mm -hmm. Allah. Mm -hmm. And that carries a lot of word. I mean, the, the uh, power, the Bible says Jesus spoke with authority. He mm -hmm. wasn't going, well, according to Dr. C.J. Smith, you could no. look at the Bible this way. Yeah, or according, yeah. you know, he just said, this is the way it is, bang, right? And that's yeah. the way we were. Um, There's a prophet in your midst. Yeah. So, um, but basically, they, they weren't interested. And, uh, but then what happened was a lot of people in Hawaii are on vacation and they were going uh, back home and saying, man, you got to hear this preaching. This is unbelievable. And that's when they realized, oh, man, we might have a real problem because we started getting calls from everywhere. We got calls from Austria. We got calls from Carolinas. We got, you know, all kinds of stuff. And this is around 1988 now. No, this was still in 1986. Oh, Sorry. wow. Yeah, oh, okay. this was in so June is, of 86. This is like um, summer holidays kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. It was a summer break. So <laughs> Harry and uh, Koresh couldn't believe it. They had never experienced anything like this before. They had never had any success before. And once again, oh, what's happening? You know, Koresh is like, I'm supposed to be the messenger of God. I've never had this success. Now this guy's gone over there, but you know, we did like, we genuinely liked each other. And so, and then word got out to them, these other offshoots. Oh my goodness, some something weird is happening. And so, um, you know, they started paying attention as well. But anyway, Koresh went to Hawaii, cut a long story short, uh, got a small group, uh, together and, uh, and and then they they moved to Texas and we got disfellowshipped from the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And the reason that I was disfellowshipped was belonging to a, a subversive, divisive organization, which I have to say was probably correct. In retrospect, yeah. Yeah. Was that uh, told to your face, or did you get a letter in the mail? I got a letter. Yeah. Quoting the church manual and everything. You know, I can't remember which rule. It was rule seven, maybe, whatever it was. I, you know. do, you, do you still have a copy of that letter? No. no. I, so I moved it out. When did you get the letter? Uh, what year? Might have been, that might have been 1987. I think it was 1987. Because we were after first. that summer, you went back and continued studying through into 87 as well to finish your. Oh, yeah, I was, yeah. I lived a double life. Yeah, uh, you know, by day I was a meek, mild, passive little fly <laughs> and Hiram. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, and then when I wasn't in school, I was going around and preaching and doing all kinds of stuff. So, building, I, I, um, building a, a support base for David Koresh, who was yeah, still, that's right. He was still Vernon Howell at that stage. He was, yeah. yeah okay. But but basically, what I did, I I. I felt guilty for the scholarly side of me uh, questioning everything. Mm -hmm. And so, although I was studying for my master's and I really respected my master's teacher, Niels Eric Andreessen, the guy is a walking bibliography, it's unbelievable. Uh, really respected him. Mm -hmm. um, and I respected scholarship, but I thought it was, it was, I was questioning too much, you know, questioning Ellen White, questioning Adventism. Uh, I didn't like how that made me felt. So I decided I'm going to put that aside. I mean, I understand what I was doing now. I didn't quite see it as clearly back then. Uh, I'm going to put that aside and I'm just going to explore this amazing mystical realm that I found myself in uh, because it was exciting. I mean, you know, we... You know, we were preaching uh, one summer. Uh, actually, I was summer of 86 as well. I just walked, wandered around, didn't worry about where I was going to sleep, preaching the Bible. This was in, you know, the mainland U.S. And uh, it was exciting. It was liberating not to worry about anything, you know. And um, it was, you know, it was exciting. It was doing the will of God. I was starting to sort of accept uh the visions uh, until I started to realize that some of the stuff I was seeing couldn't possibly be right. But at the time I wasn't there yet. So I, um, it was, it was really exciting. And then I'd 
come into the classroom at Loma Linda and just become a normal legally blind student, if that is normal. Um, but for the most part, I, I just set aside my scholarship. And unfortunately, um, that's what cost me because had I not set that aside, uh, well, let's put it this way, I made some terrible mistakes theologically and that led to some terrible mistakes in real life. So what were they? Uh, uh, some of the uh, texts that Koresh used for his wives, if I had really paid attention to the Hebrew, um, I would have rejected that. Um, that was probably the biggest uh, mistake that I made. Um, as far as interpreting end time prophecy, um, the idea that, you know, he was sort of a latter day Messiah, uh, uh, not quite as weird as you might suspect, um, in the sense that a lot of scholars and Judaism has preached for a thousand years that there are actually two messiahs, one from the house of David and one from the house of Ephraim. So I knew that as well. So I had, I was clinging on to enough scholarly knowledge to be dangerous, but I, I was rejecting most of it and just living this incredibly exciting life uh, where it seemed like we were actually doing things uh, for God. You know, we were giving up all of our possessions and just following God. And that was, um, you know, quite exhilarating. But if I had uh, been more balanced, you know, I would have known, you know, to, to reject it. And when I reassumed the mantle of, you know, what I'd learned, the scholarship I'd learned, then I realized uh, what a terrible mess I had made of things uh, the theologically. But I did a lot to systematize Branch Davidian theology and make it explainable to, to people. Um, so I, I used my scholarly abilities to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and I, as I said to you in the, the voice interview, if your foundation is wrong, then a lot of stuff on top of that is wrong as well. But it seemed plausible at the time. So, so, I so during this period, I'm just sorry to interrupt, but during this period where you felt, um, oh, also, can you still hear my voice? I've just had yeah. to change something. Uh, sure. So during this period where you were had this sense of freedom, you're traveling around, you're helping to sort of uh, uh, make the, the the doctrines, for want of a better word, of um, the, the um, Davidian movement clearer to understand, were you in reg regular contact with... David Koresh during this time and how did you keep in touch and where were you kind of sending the converts that you were gaining? Were they being told to sign up to newsletters? Did they, uh, were there little mini church sort of offshoots growing up around the place that they would go and uh, fellowship at? Tell us a little bit about the structure of, of, of things at that time. Yeah, so the basic strategy was I would go ahead uh, like somebody would know somebody and, hey, you know, can you come? And so the plan, what we did was I went ahead on my own and did the preaching, got people interested and said, all right, do you want to visit? I do, you know, now that, you know, you know, you want uh, David Koresh, who I called Vernon at the time to come and talk to you. Yeah, they did. And so then I would leave and he and Steve would um, come down and take over and then I'd go somewhere else. That's that's how how we did things. And this is this I suppose this is one area where I started to feel a little disquiet because what Koresh told us was exactly what you said. We were going to have bands of people all over the place. But he never he never set any of that up. He was more interested in just getting people to come down to Texas. First, Palestine, Texas, where we were staying, and then later to uh, Mount Carmel, where all the things happened. Um, and even, you know, Steve started saying, well, I thought we were going to, you know, go across America and you know, maybe the world, play music and set up these places all over the place. And then, you know, we'd come and visit and preach to the brethren and then go somewhere else, you know, like that yeah. sort of thing. We, we had no intention of starting official churches like 
registering in Colorado, Davidian Branch, Davidian Seventh Day Adventist. We we were thinking more in terms of just house churches because we we thought that you know we weren't going to have a mega church. Um, we never actually really talked about it, but it was sort of a common understanding that we would have groups here and groups there, and they would meet in in houses and things like that, or, or you know maybe we'd we'd find a building that we could use. Uh, but we never thought about incorporating the church um, because, you know, we thought we thought Jesus was going to come any time, pretty much. I mean, we, Koresh sort of preached that Jesus would come in 1995, but it was a sort of a, yeah, that could be subject to, to change sort of thing. So we didn't think we had that much time left, you know, nine, eight, nine years. So, you know, we, we didn't really do that, but that was the basic strategy. And there were no newsletters. Koresh would sometimes make uh, tapes that he would send to the faithful. Um, but all that, they were pretty basic um, doctrinal things. Uh, not, nothing, you know, really uh, inner circle-ish. So like he didn't talk about his wife. Sorry? Where were the headquarters during this time? So up until 1988, our headquarters was in Palestine, Texas, in in the woods. There was no running water, um, no electricity. We had a generator. Um, and then uh, we moved to Mount Carmel, where everything happened in the summer of 1988, maybe late spring of 1988. So take us through from, say, 88 to when you um, parted ways with Koresh and what led to that. Yeah, okay. So um, 19, late in 1987, uh, Lois Roden's son, George Roden, uh, who disliked uh, Vernon or Koresh at the time, challenged him to the leadership of the church. And um, he dug up the corpse of a old branch Davidian named Anna Hughes. Never met her. She died before I joined. And basically said the real prophet should be able to resurrect her. This is documented. I know it probably sounds insane. And at the time, Koresh thought that was insane as well. So he went to the sheriff and said, you know, this is what's happened. And the sheriff said, well, that's corpse abuse, but we need a picture to prove it. Let's, we'll just say the McLennan County Sheriff's Department weren't always the best at following things up, let's put it that way. And so he went onto the property with um, seven other people, sorry, eight other people to try to take a picture. But George Roden liked his guns. Um, he had an Uzi, probably a couple others. And they got caught and there was a exchange of gunfire, or at least George was shooting it at them. I don't think they shot back. Police were called. Uh, Koresh was thrown into prison along with seven of the people who went with him, one escaped. I was in California at the time, and I got this desperate call from Harry saying, you got to come down. Uh, and at that time, I was working mostly on my thesis. I was a little behind, so I didn't actually graduate until 1988. So I was working mostly on my thesis. So you have the freedom, you know, like you're not doing that much coursework at that stage. So, so I got on the next flight and went down to Texas. Uh, Koresh got out on bail. And it was a big story locally. Um, I think a national show called the Maury Povich Show took it up. You know, it was sensational. It was crazy. And uh, anyway, uh, eventually, I'll, I'll cut it short. Um, that's, that's when the guns started to come into it. So before that, we were nonviolent. Uh, and, you know, uh, we would rather get beat up than hurt anybody. Um, some of the Branch Davidians did get roughed up sometimes. 
I wasn't one of them. Uh, but anyway, so cut a long story short, um, George Roden uh, ended up in an insane, insane asylum uh, because the he, one that dug up the body. The one that dug up the body, yeah. But he didn't, he got into an insane asylum because he he ended up killing somebody. Oh my goodness! Um, <laughs> and there were back taxes owed on the property. Right. And one of uh, our members was wealthy enough to pay those back taxes, sixty eight thousand dollars worth. And that's how we got possession of the property. And and so there were guns because uh, according to Koresh, because I wasn't, I, I went back to California once things died down. Um, I just, sorry, just to back up something I wasn't sure of there. If David Koresh was opposing this Roden guy and had yeah. pretty much told the police that this guy's about to do something or has just done something stupid, why was he put in, why was he arrested? Because they, there was a gunfight at the property. At that um, time of the, the digging up of that lady. And yeah, so they, they went onto the property to take a picture David of the did. Up coffin. David and the seven or eight people. That's right, yeah. David I and the... And, right. I, I didn't get that, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, and George caught them and then started firing and then you know, I get, I get police it, were called. But and sure, since they David, were... David could have said it was them shooting at me, not the other way around. But well, that's what they ended up saying, and everybody got acquitted except I for Koresh. It was a hung jury. I see. Okay. It was a nine to three in favor of Koresh. Right, right. So it was declared, in his case, it was declared a mistrial, and they decided not to prosecute. So we've got this new scenario now where guns are on the property, and are we at the, the famous location yet where it was raided yeah that's that's where it happened yeah so this is where it is now right so we're yeah we're now getting closer to um things starting to get a bit crazy yeah so what happened was there was so george Roden owed all this you know he didn't have any income when he had, when he possessed this property that everybody came to see and so he allowed people on that property to pay rent on some of the old houses that were on this property, even though they were broken down. And some of them set up a meth lab. So when everything happened, they had to scatter. And they were not pleased with us, these meth people. Right. So that's when we kept the guns. We thought, okay, we have to protect ourselves in case they come back for revenge. Uh, and so then they, I say they, cause I wasn't there. I'll get to where I was. They posted guards at either end of the 70 acre property, 77 acres, I think it is. And it was to protect against anybody who wanted uh, revenge. And before George Roden was actually put into an asylum, it, we, people were afraid he would come back and try to get some revenge. So that's where we started turning to guns. Um, and, and well, that's where we kept the guns. Now, eventually I moved to downtown Waco. We had an old abandoned bar that we paid rent on where we stored our musical equipment. So Koresh was a guitar player. I played the keyboards and we were going to do a band and the band was called Cyrus, um, and we were going to play music and spread the word that way. So we had a we had a lot of musical gear, um, and and so we had this uh, bar that uh, that we stayed in illegally. Uh, you know, you weren't supposed to live there. It was you know, not res not zoned for it. Mm. And two of the members of the meth lab gang found out that me and another guy were there, and they came for us. Um, so uh, Koresh had given us a 22 caliber pistol and a .223 rifle. So we heard them coming, um, and I grabbed the rifle, and the other guy uh, grabbed the pistol. And I positioned myself and pointed the barrel at the approaching person. I wasn't going to tell them I'm legally blind. Uh, <laughs> and basically said, 
you know, stay away. And so they retreated when they saw the barrel of the rifle pointed at them. This is Texas we're talking about here. And um, of course, I didn't have a guns li gun license. For some reason, legally blind people have trouble getting gun licenses, <laughs> even in America. Um, and uh, so anyway, they went away and they eventually got arrested. So basically what it came down to is, you know, that's what the guns were there for. And then one day I woke up and realized that things had changed a bit. This is a little later and that the guns were there to keep people in. Wow. And, you know, like it sort of, it sort of happened gradually, you know, like you, you know, little increments and you're so busy paying attention to other things. You don't realize what's happening. Uh, but that's when the change really started with Koresh. And when I realized that the guns were there to keep us in, that's when I thought, hmm, maybe all these little things that have been niggling at me, maybe I need to start paying attention to them a little more. And maybe I've just really messed up. Mm -hmm. uh, what year and, did you have that epiphany? Uh, I, I started in 88 when I found out uh, how young – uh, one of his wives were. I didn't want to believe it. Um, Koresh and I liked each other. I tried to tell myself maybe, you know, there's a logical explanation. It was a stupid thing to do. Should have gone straight to the authorities, although the parents were in on it. So um, I probably wouldn't have got anywhere. I know that because later on when I did go to the authorities with other, about other girls, the parents were in on it and denied everything, but still, uh, I was a fool. Um, I didn't want to believe it. It was hard for me to accept that a, a theology student who graduated second in my class got an a award for, from the American Bible Society for Outstanding Achievement in Biblical Languages, and I am good at that. Um, it screw up so so badly, and I didn't want to believe that. Um, the whole thing was just, you know, gone to the dogs. Um, and then when my wife came to visit Elizabeth in 1989, she had been in Australia for a number of years. So it wasn't gradual. Like she came there and said, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. We weren't married at the time, but she just said, what, this isn't the group that I was in the last time she was there was 1987. This is totally different. She noticed the difference. Oh yeah, straight away. And she said, "You, you, I still love you, but you're an idiot. You got to get out." Mm. And um, Australian, isn't yeah, she? Yeah, I came to realize that that she was right, and uh, so then I started, you know, making plans to leave. But you didn't just walk out by that stage. Um, you had to escape, so to speak. Um, so yeah, that was there. Were, there were a lot of little things, you know, and you sort of go, well, you know, yeah, okay, well, we'll worry about that later or whatever. And then you know, eventually though, you you just say, okay, this is this is not good. And um, so then eventually, um, I made my break in September of 1989, and then by then Elizabeth and I were married, and we he allowed us to get married because. He had a lot of Australian, a lot. He had a few Australian wives at that stage. Um, and he wanted to keep him in the country. So he, he, we were the experiment to see how U.S. immigration worked. Uh -huh. uh, and so that's why we were allowed to get married. And then when I left in September, uh, Elizabeth had come back to Australia because her visa had run out. Um, and she was working. She had a, a real job, whereas I didn't at the time. So, uh, and then Koresh in, in late August, September of, of 89, he started teaching that all the women of the world belonged to him and then nobody else had the right to be married, um, which is totally crazy. And by then I knew this is this yeah. guy's a nut job. Um, and so uh, he, he knew I was having issues. And so he told people to watch me and if, I got out of line basically to take me out somewhere and beat me up. So, wow. but what happened was I was lucky that I was in California at the time. And 
he he gave me orders to this was in September of 89. He gave me orders to go back to Texas to to receive my punishment. He didn't want me to leave. Wow. But he, he thought I had to be disciplined. So I packed up my bags. Uh, everybody thought I was going to obey his orders. So I was packing my bags in plain sight. And then one day I went the opposite direction. And came here to Australia. I came to Australia via Hawaii. Yeah, my parents were still living in Hawaii. And it took them a while because they couldn't believe that anybody would defy the, the, the prophet. There, were, there was so much fear at that stage. Mm. Uh, by then I had w woken up. I'd snapped out of it. I was thinking clearly, you know, relatively clearly, but pretty clearly. I still had some unlearning to do, but for the most part, I was thinking like a normal person by that stage. Mm. And, um, and it took them a week or so to realize that something had gone wrong. Um, where did I go? And then, you know, I surfaced in Australia, told the people in Australia what was really going on because they were insulated from it, including my wife, Elizabeth, but I had told her. And then it, and then it, and then it was on, you know, it was, it was basically, uh, we got to get out of this movement. This is going to be um, uh, People's Temple, Jim Jones all over again. Um, yeah. So all the Aussies that were here, some of them had friends that were over there in Texas. Was everyone all of a sudden trying to not only leave themselves but help get their friends and family out? That's right. Yeah. I mean, once they they had left, yeah, there were still some Australians there, um, and and then yeah, they tried to to get them out. But it you know it took a while for them to snap out of it. There was a lot of fear. I mean. You know, you go against the Latter Day Messiah. Mm -hmm. You know, they read Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in the Bible, mm -hmm. Ananias and Sapphira. But not only were they afraid of of dying, they were afraid of everlasting torment. Not not you know, we still had sort of the Adventist view of hell. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but still, you know, the idea that you would you would not you would be lost, you wouldn't make it to heaven. There was a lot of fear. Uh, he... One Frank Vidian here, who was still following him, said. I know you're right, but I just can't bring myself to break away because I'm too scared. But she eventually did. And she was really good at, at getting the uh, little Carrie Jewel, a little 10-year-old girl at the time who was living in America. We got her out through her family courts because her father wasn't a member. Had uh, you witnessed any signs of his violence or um, punishment, as you said earlier, that you were about to have meted out on you if you'd gone back did you see any signs of him being physically violent or verbally violent with people uh, during your time uh not really there was one time when uh he lost his temper with me i can't remember why now this is this is before so this was so elizabeth my wife came in in april of 1989 and then she left because her visa had run out it was just a tourist visa so that five months, you know, um, there was some tension. So this incident happened then. Um, he got angry with me for some reason. I can't remember why now. Uh, and he picked up a like an iron bar or something. Mm. And he was going to go after me. And because and the houses were in ruins, and so we were starting to rebuild stuff. So there was stuff all over the place. And I picked up whatever I could find, which was some sort of crowbar or whatever. <laughs> and then, uh, so Koresh, you know, was really angry. Whether he would have swung at me, I don't know. And uh, two of the Branch Davidians, uh, Jeff Little and Mark Wendell, unfortunately, uh, died in the fire. They ran up and held Koresh back. Mm. And Koresh said, why are you protecting him. I'm the prophet. And Mark Wendell said, we're not protecting him from you. We're protecting you from him. So Koresh didn't know that I had been in a sword fighting society in my younger days. And I'm very good at fighting with sticks and swords. Um, so if, if Koresh had attacked me, he would have been the one on the ground. Uh, you know, you, you don't you don't think that a blind guy would do that, but I'm pretty good at it. Um, 
yeah, it was a medieval society. So, you know, we did all the medieval stuff and everything, but mm. we, we took sword fighting seriously. And, and, and so because we were preparing for the time of trouble, we had to learn how to fight. So I had made a deal with Mark Wendell and Jeff Little, the two that, you know, tried to stop Koresh. They knew karate. So I said, well, I'll teach you stick fighting and sword fighting. You teach me karate. And then all, some of the other guys got involved, you know. And so we were teaching each other. So they knew what I could do with a, you know, with a, uh, a weapon, a stick or whatever. Mm. And one of the other um, branch Davidians, Lloyd Houtman, who died in the fire, he was an ex-professional boxer. So he taught us boxing. And we, we did boxing training. We were jumping rope. I could do um, chin-ups like nobody's been up, down, up, down. I mean, I can't even do one now. It's terrible. <laughs> um, but we were we were training to be, you know, soldiers for God. And and so we had people, karate. I was teaching them stick fighting. Um, Floyd was teaching his boxing, which I loved the boxing training. Um, and Koresh was generally not involved in it. And I think he was he was a little concerned, you know, he was talking about learning war and all that, but he was a little concerned that some of these people could actually fight pretty pretty well. And there were a couple other people who were ex-military. So yeah, that that's the only time he, he just lost it. Um he didn't have any violence against uh, adults other than that that I saw, but he was rough with the kids. Um, he believed in big time spanking, but if you know anything about Texas, that's pretty common there. And, and Americans, you know, you would know about Adrian Peterson, the running back, former running back for the Minnesota Vikings. He got done for being very violent to his kids for spanking, and he's from Texas. So I just chalked it up to, well, that's his upbringing sort of thing. Yeah. So the, at the time you left, September 89. How many people were living on the for the property? Oh, oh, oh twenty Perhaps something. Take, take me to a Friday night worship program where he's playing the guitar and singing, or playing keyboards. How many people would have been sitting in the congregation? Uh, maybe thirty max. Maybe a little right. more than thirty. Yeah. Right. And so after you left, you came back to Australia. You alerted the Aussies. Did you? gather together in home groups with the Australian Davidians? Did you pretty much remove yourself altogether from that? And how did you make your way back to Seventh Adventism? Yeah, okay. So uh, one thing I will mention, um, um, before I left, so maybe uh, May, June of 89, um, some, of the, some of the converts from England uh, arrived at the property. That's where I met uh, Cliff Sellers. So I think there was a message in one of the, the one of the voice comments talking about Cliff Sellers from New Bone College. So I met I met a few of them at that time. Uh, so there, yeah, there I mean, thirty something. There was, the numbers were swelling. Steve was good at what he did. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, so anyway, um, back to your question. So when we got to um, Australia. Uh, of course, everybody wanted to talk to me and, and all that. And then uh, Koresh found out, and so he banned them from seeing us. So for about three months, none of the Australians would talk to us, uh, none of the followers. And we were, Elizabeth and I were on our own, which in a suppose kind of was a blessing in disguise because, you know, I had to earn a living. So I went back to uh, programming computers. I was able to, to do that and get a job for public transport at Victoria. And um, and then about uh, three months or so, uh, I had a vision saying it was time. And um, I wrote a letter saying, you know, you need to, to listen to what I'm saying. And I said, Psalm 74 is going to be fulfilled. I think it was Psalm 74. And it just so happened that Koresh had been studying Psalm 74 with his congregation, um, and that scared a lot of people. So Koresh said, you know, I found out what he had said afterwards. Uh, he said, um, all right, let's get this over with. 
or I listen to the guy, and then when you realize he's he has nothing on me, then you'll reject him for sure, and it'll all be good. So he he gave permission for me or for them to listen to me give a Bible study, but he made me go to one of the houses about ten o'clock at night. So, well, you know, you got to do what you got to do. So Elizabeth and I went there, started Bible study at about That's ten right. o'clock at night. Went for five hours. In, in Australia. In Australia, yeah. yeah. And by the time I was done, most of them were ready to leave. Wow. And that surprised the heck out of Koresh. Um, and he said, what's wrong with you people? You know, I'm the I'm the one. I'm the one that gives you all this Bible study. What could this guy have told you in, in that one Bible study that would make you leave all of this? And so two of them, um, James and Michelle Tom, uh, left for good. They said, that's it. We're, we're, you know, that's enough. The others, they wanted to leave as well, but they weren't quite as solid. But James and Michelle were rocks. You know, once they, they realized what was going on, they said, that's enough. Um, and so that's why eventually Koresh had to come to uh, Australia to try to get his flock back. And that's, uh, he came to Australia in 1990 with um, Steve Schneider. But he didn't succeed. So. Well, he succeeded in that there were some Australians who did die, unfortunately. But yeah, most of the Australians uh, didn't succeed. And that's when, uh, as I mentioned in voice, uh, Steve went to Queensland. He had some contact, and there were about 40 people interested. And that's when I went to um, President Townsend, the Victoria, is it conference? Anyway, mm -hmm. and um, said, you know, you need to do something. This is bad. By then, we had some affidavits and stuff. So he looked at that and said, oh, my goodness, this is terrible. What do we do? And that's when uh, we told the church in Queensland. I can't remember the specific church. Now, Townsend took care of all that. He was he was fantastic, uh, saying, OK, Koresh is going to prophesy that they're going to be disfellowshipped and persecuted. So you need to treat him with open arms and and all that stuff. And and the church said, yeah, but they're preaching that Israel is figuring in prophecy. And I said, who cares? That's the least of your problems right now. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to keep them away from Koresh because believe me, there are a lot worse doctrines that he's teaching right now than that. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they saw reason. And so they welcomed them with open arms, went against uh, Koresh's prophecy and they didn't join. So, um, that was all happening in 1990 here in Australia. We, when we chatted uh, over at, at Voice, um, I, I mentioned the connection. My dad was at Avondale. Uh, I think he was Dean of Students, 86, 87, 88. Um, and David Kresh had come to the campus at that time. Do you, did we work out what year that would have been? I, I should ask. I believe that would have been 1986. Right. Yeah. He, he was in Australia um, in uh, February of 1986. Uh, actually, hold on. Liz. I oh, would love to meet Liz. Bring yeah. her under the Elizabeth, door. can you come here for a sec? Just don't tell her there's 100 people watching. Uh, no, no, she's... We've been on every, we've been on, on, you know, every talk show you can imagine in America. <laughs> um, sorry, can you, you want to get into the camera view so everyone can see it? I was just going to stop dinner. Well, that's okay. So this is Elizabeth, everybody. Can, can How are you going, Elizabeth? Thank you, thanks. So Peter had a question. Um, when, when Koresh or Vernon came to Australia the first time was in uh, 86, um, did he come again? Australia or was that his only trip other than 1990 when he did the I'm Jesus thing? Uh, it was, because Peter was saying that he went to Avondale College. Yeah, my dad was Dean of Students 86, 87, 88, and he he had a, a mild uh, confrontation with David Koresh, Vernon Howell, I think at the time, and told yeah. him to get, to get off the campus. <laughs> it, it would have had to be uh, 1986. Because that's that's when he went there, and so this is Elizabeth who made me see reason. 
Nice to uh, see. Nice came to back you. in April of 1989 saying, what the heck is this? <laughs> so, Elizabeth, when you went over there in 89 and oh, Mark's wow. fully involved and it's changed so much, what, yeah. what did you say to Mark? Do you remember saying anything I to I grabbed him? him by the scruff of the neck and was shaking him saying, yeah. why are you still here? <laughs> you're, both married, you're, both married, you're, both married, you're both married at that stage. Well, well, we got married on that trip. Yeah, we got married in uh, late April of. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah, and so you then managed to convince him to leave and come back to Australia, but you spent some time in California before you came back. Was that right? Well, at, at first, I wasn't sure if if I was staying or going, um, and that was up to Koresh, and and we were actually being used uh, to find out how he could keep. Australian women in the US and so after we were married and I think that's why he gave the go-ahead was um, to find this information out mm. and then um, he sent us off to immigration to uh, make inquiries about me getting a green card and staying mm. and he said no, don't start it, just find out the information. So we found out the information. I could have got one on the spot. I could have stayed there mm. while, um, while the, the application was going through. Um, so we came back with that information and he said, okay, that's good. You can go back to Australia now. Because he said, I'm a troublemaker. <laughs> you know? Yeah, Elizabeth was always a troublemaker. They, those two never get along. There's oil and water. Yeah. When Oh, I don't put up with, you know, you say one thing one day and now you're saying the opposite the next. Yeah. What is going on? And everyone is saying, said that. And I'm going, yes, he did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing. You know, some of you uh, might have read George Orwell, 1984. A lot of Americans read that in school. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah, we've read it. It Probably. literally was like that. It would it would be, oh, but, but yesterday, you know, Koresh said this. Oh, no, he never said that. But you were there. He never said that. Well, then the excuse, the other ex common excuse was, oh, well, you know, this is present truth. You have to be here all the time to get the present truth. It might change tomorrow. It's right, like, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> By yeah. that stage, they yeah. were just all conditioned to just follow what he said. and Just go along with yeah. it. So, yeah, me being uh, away from the group for two years, you know, although it was heartbreaking at the time when I had to leave, uh, turned out to be a blessing in disguise. You know, God works in amazing ways, think, you know, ways that you can't see. And, you know, it's been my experience um, to actually see that <laughs> in, in the most extraordinary way. Mm. Yeah. So when you came so back... You drag me down under. Yeah. <laughs> so when you both came back to Australia and your um settling in initially to victoria um tell us how you kind of found your way back into the adventist church yeah um well i never left yeah elizabeth <laughs> elizabeth never left the adventist church she uh so she was a member of the burwood adventist uh church oh, the yeah. bacc Bur burwood adventist community church mm -hmm. and um and so and i hadn't been kicked out yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like Mark. Mind you, she'd been here since 1987. She really had no real notion of what was going on until she went there. Mm. So when I came to Australia, um, you know, it was like, okay, well, you know, just meet us and um, meet all the, the her friends from Burwood. And then so I met them and uh, they were really uh, nice to me. Um, they were quite liberal by adventist standards um it's still, a, it's still a great church sorry it's still a great church yeah. yeah uh going there tomorrow actually and um so anybody's going to burwood look out because i'll be there <laughs> anyway um you thought i was just an ordinary person anyway the um yeah so i i um got to know i think peter Rowenfeld was the pastor at the no he, well, he wasn't but basically by the time i started going regularly Peter Rowenfeld was the pastor. He was pretty understanding. Um, and, um, you know, I eventually 
I was pretty open with Peter. I said, look, I don't agree with a lot of the doctrines of the church, um, but I do appreciate the value of fellowship, and, I'm, and I like what happens here in terms of fellowship. I, I'm not going to preach things too controversial, though, you know, I did make him nervous a few times when I was allowed to preach. Um, but, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't harbor any ill will. I thought that my disfellowship from the Adventist church was justified, if not entirely for the right reason, but there was a lot of correctness there. And um, so eventually Rowan felt um, accepted my petition to be a member of the church, even though I told him that I, you know, I didn't agree with it, with everything. I didn't agree with 1844 and all that sort of, but he didn't care. Um, and so I rejoined, I believe it was in 1990. Um, and I've been a member ever since. So I, I teach Sabbath school there. I try not to, um, you know, I try not to make too much waves, but I do tell people the truth as I see it um, about SDA doctrinal positions. I always tell people what the SDA position is. I'll always tell them why they believe that that's true. And then I'll, if they're willing, I will tell them why I disagree with it. But I tell them the truth about Ellen White, um, you know, because at the end of the day, I do have a master's in theology. Um, and I do excel in biblical languages. Um, I know all about textual criticism and all that, and I still keep up with it. Um, and, and so I believe in telling people uh, the truth or giving them options, you know, saying, look, this is, this is what people are saying. Uh, but when it comes to um, Ellen White, you know, I will, I will tell them uh, what I believe the truth is. And, you know, as you would know, there's a lot of evidence. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, and some people don't like that. Um, in the church, uh, but I'm, you know, I don't mean to. So the the problem is that when Walter Ray came along after Ford, um, a lot of people left the church, and then they left Christianity, and then they left God. And I know you you said you were formal former Seventh Day Adventist. I don't know if you're still a Christian or not, but I found. That it was very traumatic for people. It was traumatic for me. My my answer to that was, hey, let's join a cult. Let's let's forget all this scholarly stuff. I must be really wicked for questioning. How dare I? Um, I see this now. Um, but as I told you, I was also having vision, so I needed to sort that out. Mm. Um, and so I have a very deep interest in uh, Ellen White because I know exactly what she went through because I've gone through it. I've yeah. had the same kind of visions. I didn't hold a Bible up for two hours, I'll admit that, but I know exactly what it's like to have it them. Out that, it turns out that's most likely an urban myth, that one. Most likely, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's why I said I didn't, you know, but, no urban myth here. <laughs> what, what, what you're saying is the whole process and mindset that she demonstrated and experienced, you can relate to that. I can relate to it because I made the same mistake she did, except for plagiarism, um, with respect to visions. I started seeing what I wanted to see. I started seeing things that were wrong. Um, see, we've learned a great deal from all of this. Yeah. You know, I, I don't get visions, thank goodness. <laughs> I think that would freak me out. Um, but, you know, I've seen, I mean, I, I've been around when he's had them, I've been around when Vernon had them or David Koresh, whatever you want to call him, and I've seen the repercussions of it mm. all. And, mm. and, yeah, it's it's probably something that needs to be studied. I mean, we've gone through it. We've worked through a process that hopefully keeps us out of trouble. <laughs> mm. Mm. So so just two things in, in I guess, closing. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us where you're at now with that kind of situation with visions and how do you see them? Do you see them as just um, some kind of malfunction in your brain or do you feel there's some kind of connection there with the divine? And then I just want you to, to share how you guys 
But it's great having you here, Liz, by the way. Can I call you Liz? Is that all right? Yeah, yeah that's cool. Everybody um, does. <laughs> yeah. Um, just how you both felt when you heard what was happening over there with the um, with the siege. So just share a little bit how initially just your, where you're at now with your visions. Um, do you see them as um, just something that's happening to you as a human or do you see it as something that's a bit more divine-led? And then just tell us a little bit about how you felt when you, um, you know, saw on the news the, the uh, Waco collapse. Okay, if you don't mind, I'll answer the second question first because that's the easier one to answer. Mm. Um, worst nightmare come true. Yeah, worst nightmare come true. But what happened was the uh, want, Bureau just, of Alcohol. Just to sorry. keep us that timeline, sorry to interrupt, but what was the year of the siege and the the, um, the fire? February 28, 1993 is when it started. Mm. Um, wow. March 1st here in Australia. Mm. But um, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, ATF, contacted me in, in uh, 1992, in about December of 1992. And there had been uh, reports of uh, automatic guns and, you know, illegal guns. And they were investigating. And then they stumbled on all of our previous attempts to go to the authorities. And they said, oh, my goodness, what do we have here? So I was aware that the um, ATF was investigating, and I was aware that they were going after a warrant to arrest Koresh. And I was also aware that I shouldn't say anything to anybody. So the original plan was to get him when he was by himself or only with a couple of people. He used to go to a store called String World, a music store in downtown Waco all the time with just himself and maybe Steve Schneider, a couple of people. So the uh, ATF agents, you know, they basically said, okay, well, that makes sense. We're, we're going to, um, you know, do that. But they kept us in the dark otherwise because there were already reporters. We, were talk we had talked to the reporters, so they didn't want to take a chance that we would let something slip. They, they had to trust that I wouldn't say anything um, to the reporters. And, um, and so... Uh, we we didn't uh, we basically lie because one of the reporters started getting wind of something. You know, it was a good friend of ours by that stage, Mark England, Waco Tribune Herald. And he said, do you know of anything going on? And I said, no. And afterwards he said, I knew you were lying, but I know why you did it and you did the right thing. Um, so when there was a raid and shooting, it was a, it was a shock it because wasn't it wasn't supposed to happen that way. What? went wrong we we had no idea and so we i was in australia at the time and you know so we're watching this unfold and i was just confused because that was the last thing that they were planning to do so it was it was shock um it was horror um and it was just uh, a mess and um and then when when there were all these dead people and the fbi took over uh, it was total chaos. You know, when you, when you watch a movie, you know, you know who the bad guys are, say Olympus has fallen. It's when you know who the bad guy is, you know what they're doing, you see it. And then when the movie's over, you know exactly who did what and why. And in real life, it's not like that. It was just total chaos. And when the FBI called us, uh, it was an agent named Max Howard. And he said, pardon me, but who the blank are these people? He had no idea. And I said, well, I, you know, I prepared a dossier uh, and gave it to the ATF and, and you have it. He says, no, there are a, there's four dead agents. Um, so we knew stuff before the media did. Um, there's four dead agents. There's 13 wounded agents. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's a disaster. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to them. They have, they're in no shape to tell us anything. Uh, it was, they didn't know who the Branch Davidians were. They didn't know who Seventh-day Adventists were. They didn't know who was alive, who was dead, uh, and neither did we. And it was just total chaos. It was it was just a shock to us. And they um, they uh, liaised with, believe it or not, the homicide squad in Melbourne, and sent them to pick us up and take us in. 
to ask us extensive questions about the group. Yeah, and of course, all the Australian media and police were trying to find out who the Australians were, how old they were, um, did they have military training? You know, that, those were the general things the FBI was concerned with for everybody. Um, and who the blank was David Koresh, you know, they didn't, they didn't know anything. So that's what it was like. And so we were so busy um, between the media and uh, the police. So you had the Australian media, then you had the media overseas. We hardly got any sleep. We were just wasted. Mm -hmm. like yeah. And, and we, um, just last thing on that, we, we spoke, when we spoke to the FBI, they were having a problem with all these, you know, NRA and gun people. And, and it was all just to, you know, because they'd been going to gun shows and stuff. So this was all a conspiracy to, to, um, you know, get, take guns away from Americans and all that. So they were all, you know, conservative radio was going crazy you know, Koresh was just, they were a, a weird group, but they were just minding their own business. And, and the FBI was trying to get the kids out, but Koresh was loving all the attention. He was like, oh, this is unbelievable. You know, I'm a, I'm a hero. Mm. So the FBI and I said, he, uh, he, they said he can't be a hero. You know, this was a, uh, a little later. Um, by now we know what you've been saying. Um, the ATF, you know, corroborated you got to go to the media big time and, and tell them that he's not what, you know, what he truly is a pedophile hiding behind a Bible. And so people have criticized us for going to the media so much, but we actually worked it out because what we wanted Koresh to do was to release as many kids saying, Hey, look, these guys are lying. They're normal kids. They're, you know, they were happy and, and big bad government is just persecuting us. That was the whole idea. And it worked at first. Um, and then the social workers got a hold of those kids and realized they were messed up big time. And, and the thing that um, what we knew when the kids were being released was that they were none of his kids. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, sorry if that was a long answer. I know you've, you've got no, time no, issues. No, no, it was a great answer. So I'll get back to the first great one. Mm. Can I just ask one quick thing on that? Uh, yeah. The the kids now would all be in their late twenties, thirties. Yeah. Have you been in touch with anyone from from the movement in recent years? Uh, not too much. We we wanted to leave them alone and let them live normal lives, but some have approached us to wonder about their real parents. Mm. You know how how could they have been so crazy? Uh, and one thing we we always tell them, uh, as misguided as your parents were, they loved you. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt about it. They they loved their children. They thought they were following God. They were totally misguided. They were totally manipulated. But don't think for a minute your parents didn't love you. Yeah, uh, was, uh, and yeah. that's wonderful that you've told them that to bring them some kind of um, solace, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. Um, and these are the kids whose parents died in the fire. They they um, lost their lives. That's right. yeah. um, were there adults that got out um, before? Yeah, the... one of my good friends, um, Dana, she had uh, two sons to correct. And um, one day when the older one had a broken arm, Koresh told her she couldn't take him to the hospital to get the arm set. Well, that was it. She took him to the hospital and then uh, she packed up, took her two kids and left. So her boys have grown up now and they seem to be well adjusted. I've seen her. Uh, she posts some videos sometimes on Facebook and okay. you know, she's done a great job. Mm. Yeah, and they're, they're normal kids. I think one was in the National Guard. You might be able to put in a good word for me and see if she'd be interested in doing an interview. Yeah, she, she might. She's in the process of having a book written, I think. Yeah. So it'd be in her best interest. Yeah. Have you have you both written? Uh, you've you've kept records, as you said earlier, Mark. Have you written a, this down in a book form that people could um, to buy off you and learn more about it? Yeah, it's 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 only a so so book. Um, so we wrote it with uh, Martin King, the current affair reporter. 
Mm. Um, and, and of course, he didn't want any of the real biblical stuff in it. You know, he didn't want Mark talking about his own visions and things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's it is what it is. Yeah, that, it's that's available. It does, it does tell the truth. It, it does. It, it is a book in Australia is called Preacher of Death. In America, it's called Inside the Con, but good luck finding it. It's out of print, so you're going to have to go to the used bookstore. Um, right. And it's been translated into Dutch as well. For you don't have reason. a copy there you could hold up for us to see. Uh, I think we have a copy somewhere. Um, we can find it. Anyway, Elizabeth will look for it. Yeah. Um, as for your... Um, Okay, you want to hold it up because you can see whether it's in the camera. So there it is. Where's your camera? Oh, sorry. Oh, I have to hold it down this way. Um, yeah, that, oh, there we go. And uh, to your, there we go. A little bit down. There we go. What's it? What's the title? Inside the cult. The American, the American version. version. Right. Right. Inside the cult. Yeah. Right. So if you look on Amazon, you'll probably find Inside the Cult. Yeah. So I just want to quickly address a question someone's raised. Uh, the disciples are not any more to blame for not knowing that the, the fraud they baptised any more than the Adventist church to be blamed for the fraud that was over Koresh. Um, that person needs to know we're not blaming the Adventist church for this. Yeah. This, is, this is a talk about that they only, they've only just joined. So I just want them to know that um, I'm chatting to Mark. Yeah. Well, if you think we were surprised, and, uh, the SDA yeah. church was really surprised. Yeah, this interview is not blaming the church. So that person, just so you know, no. uh, I think it's Courtney Edwards, just so you know, we're not blaming the church for this at all. Yeah, in fact, I, I, I had described how the Australian, the Victorian conference actually saved a number of people from, mm. from following it. So, mm. Yeah. So in closing, share with us your thoughts on your own connection with these visions that you've had in your life. Yeah, um, your thoughts. It's hard, it's hard to do briefly, but I'll try. So, I look at the I look at the gifts of the Spirit, teaching, evangelism, and all that, and I and I realize that people have gifts to do these things, um, you know. But you need to practice. You know, there's an art to it, um, teaching. And people who are a teacher know that you know you need to practice and. And you learn as you go and all that sort of thing. So I believe that God is always broadcasting. If the analogy I use is, let's say there's, you know, God radio. So for Australia, it'd be 3GD maybe. Um, for West Coast people in America, K-God, if you want, or W-G-O-D for the East. Um, but we are so busy doing this, that, and the other thing that we don't hear the message. And I believe that some people have a gift to have their mind in a, in a state, so theta state, for those of you who know brain waves, is beta, alpha, theta, uh, theta, delta. And I think there's a gamma that recently came around. Anyway, most people know the four anyway. There's a new one. Your mind um, is in a state to tune in to K God, our 3GD. And when you do that, um, the messages come through in the form of visions and dreams. So there is a fine line between um, schizophrenia, to be honest, and visions. I think they are very similar because if you think about it, a vision is when you're awake and you are seeing and hearing things. So the psychologist would call that a psychotic episode. Um, and that is essentially what a vision is, except that um, the vision occurs in a trance state, either a shallow trance or a deep trance. And I believe that Prophets in the Bible went to school. We know a lot of this now. Uh, and they learned how to get into the trance states and how to filter out their own thoughts so they could get a clear message uh, from God. And they started off as apprentices and so forth and so on. 
So I believe that I have a gift to do that. Uh, it certainly ran in my, my mother's family, my great grandmother, although they were Buddhists. My uh, grandmother had skipped my mother. And then, un you know, unfortunately or fortunately, I got it. So I believe that God is always trying to speak to us. And when we still our minds, we can hear the radio broadcast of God. So that's the paradigm I have. I don't think it's the, the paradigm of, you know, the Holy Spirit just descends on you and suddenly bang. You know, you're, you're getting 100% of the truth. That's the paradigm we had at the Branch Davidians. And if you want to know really what went wrong, it's really pretty simple. Two things went wrong. First thing that went wrong was Koresh painted himself into a corner. He had to be 100% right all of, the time. all of the time. And so when he was wrong, he couldn't cope, and that brought him into madness. Um, when you study the mystical traditions throughout history, um, you find that mystics, if you want to call us that, almost always straddle the edge of madness, at least in the West. Martin Luther talked about it. Uh, lots of people talk about it. And I was nearly there. Um, but fortunately for me, uh, I came out of it in time. Uh, I'm lucky in that my mother uh, was Japanese. She was trained literally in a Zen Buddhist temple for three years. And I remembered some of my meditation training. I'm not a Buddhist, I'm a Christian, but um, in, in Japan and that part of the world, children who manifest such gifts, they go to the temple and they get trained so they don't mess up. And when I finally told my mother what was going on, she was upset with me, of course, but she said, if, you, if I'd have known, I would have brought you to, even though you're a Christian, I would have brought you to the temple because we know what to do mm -hmm. in those situations. And it's those techniques um, that I remembered because I, I had some learning from my, my mother uh, and then learned some since that um, gives me a lot more control. The, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. And when you, when you read 1 Corinthians 14, what he's basically saying is, if, you, if you're going to speak in tongues or if you're going to prophesy, you wait your turn. So that means control. When you, when you look at Ellen White, she's talking, next thing, no control. Mm -hmm. right? That's what was happening to me, um, but I learned how to control. And so now um, I still have them. Um, I probably always will. Um, I have no interest in starting my own church. Uh, but I would like to believe that there are people with the gift out there. Um, in the Adventist world, of course, Ellen White definitely interests me because I really understand intimately what she went through because I've gone through it. So it's not just scholarly for me. I know what it's like to have a vision. I know what it's like to be told the wrong thing and why. Um, and now I have the understanding of what prophets learned in school, at least some, and we only know so much. We don't know a whole lot, but we know, we know a fair bit. So, you know, I would like to believe that God is still out there, that God still wants to communicate with people. And I think the whole question of understanding the voice of God, even if you don't have visions and dreams, understanding the voice of God is important. Because you've got all these people in the charismatic movements that are told to, you know, sell everything because the stock market's going to crash, and then it doesn't happen, and then they've lost everything. And there's a lot of people that get burned uh, by this. The Adventist church has got burned uh, with Ellen White. Um, but I believe she was a sincere person. She didn't know what she was doing. She didn't have any control. Um, and And she, you know made the mistakes that caused her to see the wrong thing. The only flagrant conscious, well, I mean, the, the big flagrant conscious sin that she committed was plagiarism. 
and the cover up which she participated in. She's human. She was probably afraid, man, this is a house of cards. If this truth came out, all my work's gonna go down the tube, down the drain. So I'm gonna participate in the cover up. I think she participated in the fraud. I think she lied. And I think she was human and didn't know what to do. And as a result of that, we cannot rely on her writings as a guide to the perfect, uh, unblemished will of God. That hopefully that sums it up. Yeah, that is very insightful. Very insightful. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's my opinion. But yeah, it's yeah. been really great chatting with you, Mark, and to you too, Liz. Thank you for coming in on the conversation. I think I said to Mark earlier on, I'd love to do an interview with just you at some point. <laughs> That in the yeah, because I talk too much. Let her. <laughs> no, let her, no, no. He's, he's the he's the one you want to talk. To. No, 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 no. no. You you have a valuable story too. Yeah, I'd love to because hear your story she, as well. She didn't know what was going on, yeah. and then she came in. She could clearly see what was going on, and I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, people well, you writing know, there. When you go to see one of your friends, and uh, and you know. Um, you knock on her door and she opens the door with a baby in her arms and then sees it's you and slams the door in your face. Yeah, that's how uh, I saw something I wasn't supposed to see. Yeah, <laughs> pretty obvious. Yeah. People have been very appreciative of the conversation, though, as I've just put up one of the comments. Thank you. Very insightful and beautifully expressed. Um, and there's uh, lots of love hearts going up there at the moment. Oh, I appreciate it because I, I don't see well. I can't see the chat, so. I appreciate so, that. So thank you so I much for your time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both flying blind. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if people asked any questions or anything. I imagine they would have. I, I can see this chat just scrolling big time. Yeah, so. yeah. Go, go into the conversation after. Um, I was going to open up to questions and be more specific with that. But, um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll save that for next time because um, – uh, you know, there's a whole other, that'll be two hours again if we do that right now. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. All right. Well, I'll send you the link and I'll do my best, but there seems to be a lot happening. So there's a lot there. Can... So just, yeah, just bounce into the, to the group and you'll see it there. I think you'll love a lot of the other interviews I did in season two. Some of your old uh, professors uh, are there and uh, have been interviewed and they're fascinating. Um, Larry Mitchell was one, Jerry Gladson. Um, yeah, a lot of interviews. Yeah. I think you'd enjoy it. Uh, just a quick message to those watching, please. All it takes is one little press of your finger to hit the subscribe button on YouTube and the like button on Facebook. Um, all of you who are watching right now, just do the touch or the, the mouse, get the mouse, scroll along. It takes about one second. And it really helps the, the platform. It increases our uh, exposure, gets us out into to the world of Facebook and YouTube a lot more. So I'd really appreciate that. And one last quick plug. I As a big thank you, this is the start of season four too, but as a big thank you to everyone that has been supportive of my work uh, over the last couple of years from season one right through to season four. And uh I'm offering a free song, no strings attached. Just uh, follow the link that I've written there. I've also put it in the comments, oh, sorry, in the post. And you just um, click on it and there's a free song will come your way. And I uh, just want everyone to go into the weekend with a little bit of peace, calm and relaxation. And if anybody's interested in uh, any music we did, you go to YouTube and search for Madman in Waco. Um, <laughs> that's the only one we actually recorded in the studio. Oh, yeah, I'll play the keyboard. So there you go. I think I've seen that. I actually had someone sending me lots of clips and songs this week from um, David Koresh in that era. What was the title again of the one you just said? Madman in Waco. Madman in Waco on YouTube. Everyone go. Yeah, it was when we were dealing with George Roden. There are other clips, but those are sort of practice takes and they don't sound very good. I certainly don't. You know, we were just playing around with ideas and stuff. But the only one that we actually recorded in the studio is Mad Men in Waco. Yeah, and that's on YouTube. 
Yeah, they'll be on YouTube, yeah. Yeah, oh, I'll go and watch it right now. Since, since you're talking about music, I'll throw that in. <laughs> well, uh, until next time, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, big shout out, love hearts to both Mark and Liz. And uh, we'll look forward to catching you again next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Peter. See ya. See you later. Well, you didn't.